So, um, I'm Nick Birch, currently CTO at Quanticate, which is a company based in the UK that is um, a data-focused CRO, um, helping companies run clinical trials. And one of my roles there is to build software and systems for our staff and for our customers using a really, really, really small team, because we're sort of 5 10% of the size of most of our main competitors. So the way that we manage to outcompete our competitors partly is through being smart and using open source. So I'm going to be talking more so about the previous company I worked for, which is Alfresco, who have better case studies for this particular talk. So open, 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 and various different forms. So I'm going to look a little bit about differences between being open, being open development, being open source, those kinds of things. Talk a very little bit about Apache in general, but for more on that, I'm giving a talk later in the week. And I've got three case studies, two of them about where Alfresco brought code to the ASF, one of them where they decided not to, and then I'll kind of sum up with some of the benefits and some of the disadvantages that may make you go one way or another. So. Um, hopefully, I think given the audience, you all know what open source is. Um, quite a good definition I found is saying that it's software where you can get the original source code for free and you can distribute and modify it. So you can get the source, you can learn from it, you can study it, understand it, you can make changes to it, or importantly, you can pay someone else to make changes for you. Uh, you can use your new version without paying for it. You can share your changes and improvements. Um, and the license is generally a distribution license, not a use license. So open source, great. We all love it. Open development, not so much about the source, more about what goes on with the project, how you influence the project. So open source, software today. Open development, what's going to be there tomorrow? And it's very possible to be open source but closed development. So the questions around the openness of the development. Who decides what the priorities are for the project, for the next release? Where do those discussions happen? <coughs> uh, and are they shared? You know, if the discussions are held round a water cooler in one office and never written down, that's, that's probably not going to be an open development. If they're taking place on a mailing list that everyone can see, then that's much more of an open form of development. Who can influence the direction of the project? Can anyone get involved and influence it? Or is there one project manager at one company who says what's happening and that's what goes? You know, who can contribute to it? And who di dictates when the releases are considered done? Think about those questions in relation to a project. That will give you an idea of how open the development is. Copyright assignments, um, which kick in when you want to contribute a fix or when you want to contribute an enhancement. I'll go away. Um, so copyright assignment generally requires you sign over the rights to your, to your new feature, your new bug fix or whatever, to another entity. And they can then deal with that as they want. Um, most commonly, you'll see that with commercial plus copyleft. For example, um, uh, asterisk, the open source PBX. Uh, that is open source, <coughs> copyleft, it's GPL. But the company behind it say, if you want to contribute changes or fixes, you have to assign them the copyright to that change, because they also sell uh, an enterprise version. So they want the, uh, the copyright to do with it as they want. So copyright assignments can be used for good. So the FSF, I believe, typically require copyright assignments. And that lets them do the relicensing in future, and also means that there's a single copyright holder who can go and sue people who infringe. But it can also be used for money so that your contribution can be put into a copyleft plus commercial distribution and then sold on. And they can be quite divisive. So with Asterisk, there are several big modules that are not in the core of Asterisk because the people who maintain them refuse to sign the copyright assignment. And so every time there's a new API release, suddenly this big community contribution stops working until someone reworks it. So that's not very good for the community. but. Um, you can see why the, the company behind it wants that. So even though it's an open source project, with the copyright assignment, you end up dividing the community. So that's something to be aware of. 
CLAs may initially seem the same, but are quite different. And Apache has CLAs, and you will often see debate on the legal discuss list and the incubator list about them. They're legal agreements about contribution, but they're not about the copyright. With the copyright assignment, you're handing over your rights to a contribution. With a CLA, you're saying, I've actually read the license, and you can have my contribution under the license. Licenses like the Apache software license have a section in there about contributing changes back. The CLA is basically providing a paper trail that says, I actually understood what that said and what that meant, and it's all good, which avoids issues where someone could contribute some code that they don't actually have the rights to contribute. With a CLA in place, you still remain the copyright holder for your change, but what you're saying is, hey, this change is it's actually mine and I can give it to you. Community direction, where is the project going? Um, whether it's an open source project or whether it's a proprietary project or something in between, there's, there's going to be a process to decide the direction. It may not be a very good process, it may not be a formal process, but there will be a process that, that decides you know, where, where it's going to go. You know, how can you consider a release to be done? What features are going to be worked on? What features are not going to get worked on? Um, who can join in? All those sorts of things. Um, if you have an open source project that is in-house or controlled by one company, you're going to be making a lot of the decisions on that list. If it's an Apache project, then there are rules within the Apache way about how people can get involved, who gets to say when something is done. So if you're kind of wanting to evaluate a new project that you're thinking about getting involved in, if you think about that list there, that will give you some sort of idea of if this is a project that you can get involved in and, and bet your business on, or if this is something that you maybe treat as a black box and you're never going to get involved in, but if it works today, then that's, that's great. Um, and then another thing that you need to think about, licensing. So all the open source licenses are distribution licenses. Most commercial software that you buy, their use, not distribution. Um, and then you need to think about, is it a copyleft license? Is it a permissive license? Um, there are the strong philosophical divides. Then there are also quite different business models that the two licensing families support. And if you are thinking about bringing your commercial copyleft project to Apache with the relicensing onto a permissive license, you need to be aware that the available business models to you will be altered by the different license. So there is no one true way. The ASF feels that it has the least worst way for its projects, but that's not going to be universal. Um, so as, as a sort of general community thing, you need to think out what's going to be right for you before deciding if you should bring your project or not. So I've got, I've got my three case studies in a, in a few minutes, which are going to look at cases when it was a good thing and when it wasn't. So, ASF, who, who here is a, a, a member? Who here is a committer? Who here is new and looking slightly scared? OK. <laughs> right, so what is the ASF? It's a US 501c3, not for profit. Um, doesn't make money, tax deductible donations, uh, mustn't be influenced by any one company. It needs to be for the good of everyone. Uh, and it was founded in 1999 with one single project, and today has over 150 projects. Um, tries to be meritocratic, community-driven, open source. So that anyone can get involved, people earn their participation through their merit. And decisions should be taken by the community, and all the work on the project should be done by volunteers. Many of those volunteers will have a day job, which has an interest in that project, but they should be there working as a volunteer. Um, <coughs> it's driven by the projects. It's not an organization where someone at the top says, I think we should have another big data project. It's one where people bubble up from the bottom and say, hey, we've got this idea for this new big data thing. It doesn't quite fit in any of the other ones, so we're going to join the incubator and grow it that way. So each project is responsible for its own code and for its own community and where it's going to go. All the board does is provide the, the oversight to make sure that things are working well. 
the board doesn't say what gets written. The board doesn't say what doesn't get written. Uh, it doesn't tell a project which direction to go in. It doesn't come in and say, hey, Hadoop, you need to work on that name node thing. That's really important. And that's all down to the project. All the board will say is, hey, Hadoop, maybe you need to check your trademarks because there's some bad things going on. Or, hey, Hadoop, maybe you need to think about splitting yourself out because you're getting a bit big and unwieldy and it's really hard to check that you're doing the right things. But it's not going to come in and say, work on the name node. The board is only interested in the community. Um, Foundation does have some common support, like infra and press and trademarks, which are there to help the projects focus on the code in the community, not on how to keep the source control working or things like that. So if you want to know more about that, Wednesday, 9 AM, I'm talking an entire 45 minutes on that. So first case study, uh, bringing some code to the ASF. So I um, don't know if any of you heard of Alfresco before, but it's an open source enterprise content management system and associated company. Over a million active users, more than 4 million downloads. There's now a cloud version as well. There's quite a few people on it, which makes counting the user numbers a bit more complicated. Um, it's open source, but it is largely not open development. Decisions on what is in the project, what isn't in the project, what's in the next version are taken by the company, not by the community largely written in Java and JavaScript. And it's all about enterprise content management. So capturing, managing, storing, preserving, collaborating, editing, versioning, all those kind of things. Um, and it's built on top of lots of Apache projects, as well as some projects from Spring and some others. The core project itself is LGPL. Um, so if you've got a content management system, some quite basic things that you often wanted to do are transform that content to something else and tell you what is in that content. So typically, transformers are used to give you a full text version that you can then index or generate a, a web preview or something like that. And the metadata extraction is you've got a Word document that's already got the title and the author in it, and you upload it. And you'd quite like that information to be carried across so you don't have to re-enter it again. Because if you re-enter it again, if it's in two places, both of them are wrong if it's in one place. There's a sporting chance that that one will be right. Um, so if you upload your Word document, you're going to get a full text index and a PDF version of the author and things like that. So in Alfresco 3.3, those were the formats that were supported for full text indexing and extraction of metadata. Um, Apache Tika, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, is a uh, Apache project from 2006 initially grew out of Lucene, but now has lots of different uses. Um, there's talks on it this afternoon and on Wednesday, if you're interested. Um, but it provides a way of extracting metadata from all sorts of different file formats. It provides a way of getting out the plain text content of files as plain text and as XHTML. And it hides all of the complexity of all the different libraries and file formats and things. It just gives you this nice, simple way to go to and say, I've got a document, and what I really want is some plain text help. You may notice some similarities between what I was describing with the Alfresco metadata and content transformers and Apache Tika. Lots of people have the same problem, which is, here I have some stuff, and I'm not even sure what it is. And over here, I have a text indexing system. And question mark, question mark, question mark magic goes here, required. So what, what did... Um, what did Alfresco do um, when they decided that maintaining their own code was troublesome and a lot of work and you could support a lot of formats? And in the meantime, the Apache project had grown up and started covering a lot of the same area and starting to reach feature parity. So first up, identify the upstream projects. Work out where the current Alfresco code could go to and what those projects are, which were mostly Apache Tika and Apache POI. Then got the latest versions of the code base. It's no good writing a patch against a two-year-old version because it's probably not going to be accepted by the community. And then compared all of that Alfresco code with the upstream versions and looked at them and said, you know, what, what areas is Alfresco currently better? What areas is Alfresco actually a long way behind and maybe you just want to throw away the Alfresco code <coughs> and, and run with the, the community stuff? Um, work out, you know, where is it an improvement? Where is it a whole new feature? 
and then worked with the upstream projects to share with them the vision. You can't just turn up with a massive pile of code and say, here. You have to say, hey, guys, um, you, guys you don't currently have any support for this, and we do, and we think maybe you might want to have this contribution. So spend a bit of time working with the community to get the buy-in for it. Then produce patches, submit them, get the feedback, get the improvements, um, and then gained committeeship on the projects. And then pushed all of the existing Alfresco code that was better into those upstream projects. Um, and then update the upstream project versions in Alfresco and check that you haven't broken anything and then fix the bugs that you have broken. Um, and then we wrote uh, wrappers for Tika that allowed Alfresco to call Tika to do the work rather than Alfresco calling the library directly. Converted all of the Alfresco codes called Tika. Used all the unit tests that we carefully wrote in step one to make sure that we hadn't lost any functionality. Turned on all the other formats and project management were amazed. So that was Alfresco 3.3. Fresco 4.2 has all of these, and these, and those, and probably one or two others. So that's quite a big improvement in functionality that came from sharing with Apache Tinker and Apache Poi what Alfresco did well, and then throwing away the original Alfresco code that hadn't made it into upstream, switching to just use an Apache project, and then benefit from all the contributions that the community made. And then this slide here, these are all the formats that will be in Alfresco 4.3 in a few weeks when my old colleagues at Alfresco update the Tika libraries in Alfresco. So that many new features, that many new formats in, a, in the next Alfresco version for the cost of updating four jars, a couple of dependencies, and running unit test suite to check that it's still working. Can you see how you might be able to sell your boss on the benefits of this whole sharing thing if you say, for, for about two hours' work, we can add all these new formats? Easy. So, big success, that one. So, case study two, going to look at Alfresco and Apache chemistry. So, CMIS is an OASIS standard for... Can I wait till the end for questions? Um, I can take some now if you want. I was just, so now you're... Basically, pulling an Apache license code and combining it with, is it LTPL2, Alfresco? Yep. How do you manage the compatibility issue there? Um, the Apache How license. The, manage that? Uh, <coughs> the Apache license is largely a universal donor. So you can take Apache license code, put it into an LGPL project, and everything is fine. You can't take LGPL code and put it into an Apache project because then the LGPL takes over. Okay. I'm not sure if anyone is speaking on licensing today um, and, and this week. If not, if you pop along to the bar camp on Thursday, you can do a session there about licensing and directionality and all that kind of thing. But it's actually fine for um, an LGPL project or a GPL project to have Apache dependencies, and it's the more restrictive license that wins. So, CMIS, Content Management Interoperability Services. Bit of a mouthful, that's why everyone just calls it CMS. So, it's a standard for talking to content repositories. Big, boring, very important pieces of software in almost any large organization where you put all the stuff and, and hopefully get it back out again later. And CMIS provides a standard way to log in, then navigate around that repo, search for things, upload new documents, version them, delete them, change the permissions on them, change the properties, link them all together, query them, all that kind of thing. Um, and there's quite a large range of content repositories that support it now. Adobe, IBM, Microsoft, Alfresco, SAP, EMC, all of, the, all of the big names in content now support this standard. So if you're going to be writing some code and you need to store your content somewhere, it may be worth you using CMIS as an abstraction layer so that you can then deploy to all these different content repositories based on whatever the people buying the software or using the software are going to want to do. And CMIS 
1.0 came out in 2010, CMIS 1.1 was 2012, end of. So that's CMIS. Um, Alfresco was one of the companies heavily involved in drawing up this standard. Um, and the first Alfresco release with CMIS support was before the CMIS 1.0 specification was actually available. Um, so it was actually used as part of the feedback on the specification and Alfresco were implementing their own open source implementation of CMIS and saying, hey guys, I think we maybe need to look at that, that section there because it's not actually proven very easy to implement. And the first support was developed internally, directly on the Alfresco code base under the LGPL license. Um, and it took quite a while to implement, not least because the spec wasn't finished and was changing and there were no test suites. Um, and when it was finally implemented, they found some architectural issues with it because you know, if you're targeting something that's moving, it's hard to get everything right to start with. Um, and quite a lot of it was written in JavaScript rather than Java. So there was a desire for a pure Java version once 1.0 was out that could be used because most of the code base in Alfresco was Java anyway. Um, so they wanted a, a more robust one. And there also was a desire for there to be a, an open source client available for lots of different platforms. Um, and a desire, obviously, not to have to do all of that work in-house because that was expensive. So next problem, two rival camps. Why have one when you can have two? So Alfresco, OpenText, and SAP were working on an open source Java client and a server as the Open Seamus project. Nuxio, Adobe, and a few others started an incubating project called Apache Chemistry. So you now had two different open source Java implementations of the same standard with strengths and weaknesses, but very different ways of developing and, and governance. So the Apache incubating project was trying to be very open in terms of development, in terms of participation. And the, the Open Seamus one was mostly taking place on private mailing lists, weekly status calls, all those sorts of things. And there was a lack of trust between the two camps because you had the people who were very interested in the open development and then the corporations who were a bit more reluctant to get involved and worried about how this was going to take off. And the other problem was that the top group there didn't really quite understand what the Apache way was. And they had some misconceptions about what was going to be entailed with it. And they were worried that they were going to lose control. So they came up with the idea of contributing Open CMIS to Apache, so that there were then two incubating projects, um, which, as you might imagine, generated an awful lot of debate about whether or not it was right to have two different incubating projects tackling the same thing in almost the same way in the same language. Um, and eventually there was a get-together in Munich, and lots of people debated this. Um, but because it was taking place under the auspices of the incubator, there'd be a lot of debate for two hours, and then you'd have to say, stop, 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 write it up, put it to the mailing list, have a cup of tea, okay, now we can carry on. Because not everyone was in Munich. And if you let it all happen around the water cooler in Munich for those who could come, then you're not really being very open in terms of development and welcoming for the community. Um, and as it happened, it's actually quite good to make people stop and write it up rather than just keep debating. Because if they can agree when they write it up, then you've got something to base it on and go forward. So the outcome of all that was a merged project, Apache Chemistry, which combined the best of the two different communities and different code bases. And there was loads and loads of activity, because suddenly there's all these people who are all joined together, and they're all contributing, and they've got this plan and this vision that they'd hammered out in the open, collaboratively come up with a plan, worked on it. Out came the server, the server framework, the test. Uh, test suite, all of that sort of thing. And it took some time to implement that into Alfresco, and also took some and, uh, Alfresco engineering effort to contribute to this project and get it up and running. Um, initially, when the first uh, Apache Chemistry release came out, there were only a couple of companies that used it, and then lots of other companies who used it as a test suite, but wrote their own implementations of the server against the spec. And then going forward, Alfresco started getting lots of bug fixes for free. When someone found a bug in the server implementation, 
They fixed it upstream. Alfresco pulled down the new release, ran their own test suite, went, oh, excellent, four bugs closed by someone else. Some nice man from SAP has done it all for us. And then more and more companies started basing their CMIS implementations on Apache chemistry. When they started looking at how much work it actually took to write one of these things versus the fact that if you took the OpenSEMA server, uh, there were like five interfaces that you had to implement against your own server. And as long as you had a roughly similar domain <coughs> model, actually it was really, really quick. And then it was all done. So you started getting this virtuous circle of enhancement where lots of companies got involved then they prov provided fixes and enhancements and then the project just kept getting better. Um, CMIS 1.1 support was mostly added by SAP to Apache chemistry. And so adding the CMIS 1.1 support to Alfresco was, I believe, measured in man days versus man years for the initial implementation because they upgraded the libraries, looked at the new methods that they had to implement, implemented them, ran the test suite, fixed the problems, ran the test suite, fixed the problems, shipped it. So SAP did almost all the work, and Alfresco effectively got the new protocol support almost for free because they had collaborated with everyone and gone in for this project. So, two different kind of contributions. First one was about taking some existing pieces of code, contributing them upstream, reaping it back. With chemistry, it was about collaborating to form the project and develop it and then use it. My third case study is about activity. BPMN 2.0 workflows. Has anyone experienced the joy and excitement that is business process no modeling notation? No. Riveting stuff, riveting stuff. Um, it's a way of describing your business processes that you can display visually, but also the important thing that came with version two was that you could execute them. So the business analyst draws out all of the swim lanes and decision points and things, but then that same file that they've developed, you can actually run it in a, in a, in a workflow engine straight away. Um, so it's the industry standard way of doing it. Um, in the past, each engine would have its own way of taking the design and implementing it and actually running it, whereas for BPM 2.0, in theory, everyone could take this design thing and, and run it. So, our Fresco workflow, originally it was all based on JBPM. And in um, 2010, JBPM was LGPL, largely owned and developed by Red Hat. Um, and our Fresco were finding some problems with JBPM that were hard to fix and maybe seem to be slightly architectural issues in decisions been made in JPPM five, six years before that were starting to grate. Um, the JPPM core developers were interested in doing a rewrite to fix some of these architectural issues. Red Hat management were more interested in just keep selling licenses and, and keep going with the existing one. Um, Alfresco was trying to reduce the number of copyleft dependencies in the code base, even though the main product was LGPL plus commercial licenses. They wanted to reduce the number of copyleft dependencies because that gave more flexibility. And JBPM was one of the biggest LGPL dependencies in the project at that time. And Alfresco had shifted away from Hibernate, but JBPM was still Hibernate. So you then had to have your product with two different database engines in it, and then your support team had to know how to diagnose two different sets of problems. So there was a sort of interest in ditching JBPM. So the decision was, take some VC money, pinch a couple of the core JBPM developers, and set them loose to do a brand new BPMN 2.0 open source implementation. And it was going to be under the Apache license. So that was the decision. Start again from scratch with everything you've learned from doing it before, but do it under Apache license. Don't use Hibernate and try and get lots of other people involved. And Alfresco was going to be the launch customer, since Alfresco was funding most of it. But the idea was that everyone else who was interested would also be able to use it and, and build on it. And it needed some changes to Alfresco to be compatible with the second engine, and then it needed all the work to actually implement the engine to start with. And it was going to be Apache 2 licensed, but 
the debate was, should this be an Apache licensed project or an Apache licensed project at Apache? It was brand new code base, didn't exist before. There were no issues about copyright assignments and who owned what. There's no issue about would the community take one direction or another because it was a brand new project, brand new community. Alfresco wanted the next <coughs> release of Alfresco to ship with activity. So there was a strong pressure for a shipping date. There was an Alfresco conference that was going to be launching the next version of Alfresco. And one of the big features of that new release of Alfresco was activity. So it was going to have to have the first release of activity out to be integrated into it so that you could hit the launch date and you can't move a conference because that's expensive. So Alfresco had a strong interest in making sure that the version of done was going to be compatible with that release. And the initial feature set was pretty much decided. Everything that Alfresco used in JVPM had to be present in activity. So the initial roadmap 1.0 feature set was again decided by Alfresco. And Tom Byans is a BPMN god. Just one of the best people in the world at BPMN. But um, that's a BDFL. Tom knows everything about BPMN, has strong visions about what should happen. It's a bit like Linus with Linux. You've got one person with a vision who everyone looks up to, but then that's not necessarily going to be a welcoming and collaborative environment. You can't really go up to Tom and go, yeah, I think you're wrong about something quite core. <laughs> um, so um, it wasn't looking like a great fit for the incubator, because how are you going to be an open development if the feature set has already been decided? Uh, how are you going to be welcoming of everyone coming involved if you've got a couple of very experienced people who have their own very strong vision? So in the end, the decision was taken that it should be open, it should be welcoming of new people, but it wouldn't take place at Apache because the initial trade-off, the benefits, the risks didn't weigh up. Um, it is possible for it to join the incubator later. I don't think it actually will now. I think they're, they're, they're doing quite well on their own. But there was always the option to start out on their own and then come over later if they wanted to. But in that case, it was all debated. Eventual conclusion was actually, thanks, but no thanks. We won't come to Apache. So what are benefits of bringing your code, your open source code, Apache. So one of the big ones, I'd say, is the shared maintenance. If you share upstream, you push your code up into Apache, your support overhead is shared with all the other companies taking part in the project at Apache. And you get lots of companies that can join in, individuals, companies, organizations, universities, and they can all contribute towards the project and share it. When other people extend the project, you benefit for free. So if we look back at this, the Tika things, Alfresco, as far as I'm aware, contributed nothing to any of those enhancements in Tika 1.6. So Alfresco is going to get the benefit of all of those for free because they put the work in earlier to share it. Ah, go away, Wi-Fi. I don't need Wi-Fi. Right. So you can benefit for free from the contributions other people make to your project. Um, the more users you have, the greater the chance of community-provided enhancements and fixes. There is no promise that because you're open and you're Apache, that the magical developer fairies will come by and sprinkle your project with bug fixes and things. No promise. It's just more likely to happen than if you aren't. Um, if you've got more users, you'll get more bug reports, which is generally a good thing. But there's also a higher likelihood that your bug report will come with fixes. Because if more people who are using your thing are other developers, it's more likely that when they find a problem, they'll share it. We think about the Alfresco metadata extraction thing. When it was an Alfresco piece of code, the only people using it were Alfresco customers. So they'd come along and say, sometimes the title doesn't come from my Word document. When it was in Tika and it was being used by people building solar, being used by other companies, they tended to come along and go, 
sometimes when I'm indexing the internet with this piece of code, 4% of my documents don't come through with a title. And here are 12 <coughs> different publicly available documents that show the problem. So more likely to get good bug reports with fixes. Got obviously, lower per organizational cost if you're all sharing it. And often, your development's faster. So shared maintenance, good thing. So saying, you get, tend to get better bug reports. People who are involved in open source tend to know how to report bugs. They're more likely to say, step one, step two, step three, step four, expected actual sample file. End users tend to go, sometimes the software doesn't work. So if you share your code, you've got more people using it, more likelihood that they'll be <coughs> experienced in open source and know how to report good quality bugs. Um, I found a bug, but I can't share the details. Yeah. Sometimes my document doesn't work. Which document? Well, it's my company's financial modeling document, so you can't have it. How am I supposed to fix it? Well, you're the expert, aren't you? Whereas then you've got the guys from Nutch who say, well, 4% of archive.org doesn't work, and here's, here's a list of documents. And these are the documents that show the problem that are under 100 kilobytes that can be used in unit tests. That's, that's a lot better. Um, and if your bug reports are open, it's more likely someone will come along and say, hey, I've had the same problem too, and here's some more details. Um, and if you're, if you're open and you've got lots of other companies, there's more likely that they'll have their own dedicated testers. Dedicated testers, they don't invent bugs, but they just somehow make them more visible and things. New ideas and new features. If you've got other companies who feel they can base their business on your project, they feel that they'll have some involvement, some say about it, so they can dedicate more resources. And if individuals feel that they're going to be valued, they're more likely to spend some of their free time working on it. More developers, more ideas for fixing problems and enhancing and so on. Um, and when contributions are felt to be welcome, people are more likely to stick around and more likely to share their own things. With the Apache license, it's a take your toys and go home license. So if, if, if you're using Apache Tika and you've come up with some special secret source that makes it better, there's no obligation on you to share that back with the community. You can't claim you invented Apache Tika, but <coughs> the secret source bit, the extra plugins and so on, you can, you can keep that and you can sell that. But if you feel that you're welcomed in the community and you feel that the community is doing good things, it's more likely that you're going to give back that plugin to Tika and make it all better. Um, and typically, you'll get small changes over time, but they'll, they'll come through and they can get bigger. So learning from the best. The world is very big. And no matter how smart you are, there is someone somewhere on the planet who will be better than you Maybe not on everything, but on some specific thing. And there are an awful lot of people who've tried inventing that wheel before and worked out that six sides was at least better than four, and certainly better than three. So if there are more contributors, there's more chance of someone popping along and improving the idea. And I found that a lot on open source. I'll come up with an idea, and I'll contribute an initial fix. And then a few weeks later, someone will come through and basically rewrite almost all of the core logic of it to make it better and faster and more maintainable. And they'll have kept my idea, and they'll have kept my API interface. But they'll have like, rewritten the core, and it's so much better. If I hadn't started that, it would never have occurred to them to improve it. But when they see what I've done, they go, oh, no, I did something like that a while ago, and oh, well, yeah, I can improve that. And then the code gets better. And then when I see how they make the code better, I can then learn for next time how to do it better in future. So you can then collaborate with lots of people from lots of different companies, lots of different organizations. Diverse users and developers is important. Within open source, we tend to be a bit of a monoculture. Looking around this room, we've got one non-white person, one woman. Some organizations better than others, but let's be honest, this is not a representative group of the people using our software, is it? So if you draw from a very small pool of people, like one company, you're going to have people who tend to think the same, and they'll be tending to make the same mistakes. If you've got people from all around the world, all sorts of different walks of life contributing, 
even if they're only contributing a little bit, they can contribute some important things that make you aware of some diversity. And the best time to fix a mistake is at the start. You would not believe the number of times when I was working in Alfresco that in late March, a load of unit tests would break. So we were a company based in the UK. For half the year, the UK is on UTC. And then sometime in March, flips over to UTC plus one, unit test break. If we'd had more community members from around the world, we'd have found out before that March day that that code actually only worked in UTC and in nothing else. Luckily, time zones changed and we picked that one up. But it shows that if all of your developers, no matter how smart they are, if they're all in the same place, all thinking the same way, maybe using the same software, maybe using the same laptop, maybe using the same time zone, the same language, you'll get problems. If you've got people from all around the world, you can come along and say, are you aware that there's more languages than English? And maybe we're going to have to localize this user interface. And maybe we should put that localization in at the start, when that's easy, rather than for version 4.5, when it's all baked in with hard-coded strings. A diverse group of people, they can flag these problems up early, and then they're cheaper to fix. Community and goodwill. Sharing and being open. Everyone loves that. Yeah, positive press, it's great. So your organization can gain from the positive press of the project. If it's your project and only your project, then you're not going to get a lot of good press. But if you've been a major contributor to Apache Foobar, and there's a press release about Apache Foobar, you can, you can gain some of the glory that goes with the project, the halo effect. And open source projects with lots of people involved and lots of things happening generate more buzz, so you're going to get more of a halo effect. Um, and then if you're known as a good team player, it's easier to call in a favor for a critical bug fix. If you're the only ones contributing to this project, it's going to be very hard to find someone else to work on that critical bug fix when it's Friday evening for you and you really need to get this fixed by Sunday and it's a national <coughs> holiday and you're all going to go home and no one's going to work on it. If you're part of a big open source project with people from all around the world, it's a greater likelihood you can say, guys, girls, help. You've got to help us. This is really, really important. We'll buy all of the beers at the next meetup if someone can look at this tomorrow. And if you've been a good team player, there's a reasonable chance someone will go, yeah, that bug looks interesting. And oh, I think that bug's going to bite me when I upgrade my library. So yeah, I'll, I'll spend my Saturday on that. And it also helps when you want to get involved in other projects. When I go to other Apache projects with a problem, they recognize my name, and they're much more likely to take it seriously, even though I'm the newbie on that project. Uh, come to the Apache Way Talk. We'll talk about it then. <laughs> um, three companies is normally considered the minimum to get a bit of diversity, but you, you, more, is, more is good. So we've got about seven minutes left, so I'll just skip on the downsides, reasons why you might not want to join the lovely, happy, feather-wearing group that is Apache. Probably the biggest one is the lack of control. If it's your project, Someone from management says, this is what the new feature is in 4.3. And as long as that's possible, that's what the feature is. So you can very easily make a decision and get it done. If it's an ASF project, you need to go to the community and say, hey, I think the big new feature in 4.3 should be this thing. And then you have to convince the community of why this is a good idea. Um, if it's in-house, get four of you around the room, have a coffee, talk about it, decision done. If it's an ASF project, you need to write it down, you need to put it on a wiki or in a JIRA or something, share it with the community, wait for feedback, wait for everyone to have a chance to review it. Now, maybe that's a good thing, because more people look at it and go, you do know that's never going to work, don't you? But it does take longer, it, does, it is harder. And management tends to understand traditional processes. If I'm a manager, I can say, hmm, I've got five developers, so I can get four, four and a half days work out of them every week. I'm going to tell them what to do, and they're going to do it. Try and explain to your management that what you're going to have to do is take their idea and write it up and put it on a wiki page and then wait a week and then feedback on it and then start going. The management don't see the benefits that we've covered in previous slides. It's very hard to convince them. It's 
to go for this. Release dates. If your CEO is going to be standing up in front of the company's annual meeting in three, week, three weeks' time to announce the shipping of the new release, and your company project is based on top of an Apache project, and it's a community decision to do a release, there's going to be a potential mismatch if people aren't aware of what goes on. You know, the CEO might be able to say, I don't care about the number of bugs, it's going gold tomorrow. Your CEO cannot tell an Apache project to plus one a release. And your CEO cannot demand that someone on the other side of the world fix a bug that's important to him. The community is really excited about this new feature that they're all working on and this great new thing that's happening. It's going to be very hard to get them to freeze the API and do a 0 .0 release if they're all still excited and working on it. And if you're on a different release cycle to the rest of the community, if you've got the big company release coming up that you're going to need a release for, and they're all saying, well, we've got six months to ApacheCon, and we're going to release at ApacheCon, you're going to have to do a lot of the boring bits to get the release done, because the rest of the community isn't interested in a release now. So you're going to actually do more work than if it was in-house, because you've got to do it in the open. And you're going to have to get the community to share your vision. So if you're all going different ways, Maybe your company can be the one that maintains stable branch, primarily, and let everyone else go off and do exciting things. Or maybe you're the guys who are doing all the work on head, and everyone else is sat back on the maintenance branch going, well, we'll I think we'll wait for that to, to solidify a bit. But then you've got this extra overhead of trying to maintain and manage the community, which can be good, but it is a downside. And maybe you're going to decide for your company that's not right. Uh, direction and features. I think we talked about this already. If it's an ASF project, you've got to explain it to the community and get buy-in. So an internal project with no open development, someone says what it is, and off you go. Oh, and another thing to be aware of. If you're taking an Apache library and adding some secret source, there is nothing stopping the community looking at your marketing slides and saying, hey, that's a really neat thing. Let's put it in core. And your community, so your value add, your special source, suddenly becomes part of core. So you can't stay still. You're going to have to keep evolving. As the project gets better, your secret source is going to have to keep getting better. Um, marketing and branding. If it's your project, you can do with it what you want. If it's your brand, you can do what you want. If it's an ASF project, then the ASF trademark and branding rules kick in, and you mustn't confuse people about what's going on. Um, you can't say Foo Corpse Hadoop. Well, you can, but you're going to get slapped down really, really quickly. There are specific rules about what you can and can't say, powered by, built on, distribution of, that kind of thing. And you've got to stay within those rules. And maybe that's not worth it. If your company is really, really focused on this project, and your company's brand is almost the same as the project's brand, that's going to be too big a shift if you start pushing that out into open and giving that the community control. And then when you have to start communicating and coordinating with the rest of the community on the branding and the press releases and teaching your marketing people how not to annoy the rest of the community with how they describe the project in the press release and potentially a big loss to control, potential risk of bike shedding. So it maybe isn't right if the branding and the trademark is very, very central. So in summary, you get more involvement, better bug reports, better testing, other companies, including your competitors, joining with you and sharing, collaborating. Um, you know, with the chemistry case, you know, you had Alfresco collaborating with its biggest competitors on this single library, which was great. You know, you got your more diverse community, you get your better bug fixes and, and opportunities and the fix for free, and it's great. But you're no longer in charge, you have to give up control to the community, things are not it's not instant. You know, this is not like you throw it over the wall and it's open and magic pixies and unicorns and rainbows and it's all great. You, know, you have to put in a lot of work to change it. You need to train up your marketing team and your management to understand how it's different. It's not all smooth sailing. There will be problems. Your BDFLs are not going to be allowed and no jerks. You're going to have to work with the community. You may have to tone some people down. So we are out of time, but it's lunch, so we can have a few questions if you're not too hungry. Are there any other criteria for just uh, jumping down here? Past 
Uh, yes, and there are three talks on it, I think. <laughs> um, so if you want, come up to the front afterwards and we'll point them out on the schedule for you. But yeah, there's lots of talks about the Apache Incubator, the ways it works, the ways it doesn't work, how to get in. And it'd be best off if you go to one of them or look at the slides from them, rather than me trying to rush it in a few minutes. <coughs> Was that one at the back? No? Okay, did you have one? Yeah, um, it's an alternative to ASM. Some similar organization that also provides a community path. And there's a way of it. It's not, not so much. I mean, it depends what language it's written in. You know, if you're, um, if you're a Perl thing, then maybe the, the CPAN and, and that group will provide some of the community. If you're Python, then again, there's the Python Foundation, Python Software Foundation, and they have their own community things. If you're involved in Microsoft and the .NET stack, um, I can't remember what it's called because it's changed its name quite recently, but they have one that started off being very close into the corporation and they've pushed it away and tried to encourage it to be more open and support lots of different licenses. Foundation. Could be, unless well, it's changed. What it was called, I think it was yeah. yeah. I don't if you're interested, then I can point you with people who know about that. So there are different ones out there. And then you've got things like the Eclipse Foundation, which tends to be more member-led. So companies will pay for membership of Eclipse, and then they get more say in what goes on. That, will that, that, that may or may not be right for your project. Apache is not right for everything. So um, it, it is worth checking and, and investigating the options and, and decide. There are organizations out there that have modeled themselves on the ASF, and they kind of describe themselves as like the ASF, but for X. But running a foundation is quite a lot of work. So don't don't do it for the fun of it, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, let's thank Nick for So those are my details. Give me a shout if you've got any questions later.